Hello, I'm Dawn Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. Belief based versus evidence based math assessment and instruction what school psychologists need to know to improve student outcomes. This is the recent article written by our two guests today, Dr. Amanda Vander Hayden and Dr. Robin Cotting. We've had the opportunity to dig deeper into this topic and the tensions that both of you have brought awareness to in this piece, so I want to thank you for continuing to talk with us on Patent Pod today. So far, we've talked about the difference between evidence-based and philosophy-based practice. We've talked about fluency versus automaticity, and we addressed the tension of anxiety in mathematics. So I want to talk now, I just want to pivot a little bit and talk about executive function. So just so we're all clear, if you could just kind of explain to us executive function, just so we have a good solid understanding of what we're talking about. Sure. So, I mean, I think one of the important things to remember is that there's a lot of different ways that this term or phrase executive functioning is referred to. Um, whatever resource you find, there's going to be a lot of different um, interpretations or words or um, processes that are incorporated. I think the one that I'm going to um, articulate today suggests that executive functioning is a set of processes that allows us to select and monitor behaviors to attain goals. It is, uh, represents the part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. And some experts refer to executive functions as the conductor of mm. cognitive skills or the command and control center. Um, when we're talking about types of executive functioning, often we hear reference to working memory. Mm -hmm. So working memory is the ability to hold information in mind while using it. We hear things like cognitive flexibility, referring to thinking about something in more than one way. And we think about inhibitory control, which is also referred to as self-control. It's the ability to ignore distractions, resist temptation, and stay focused on the task at hand. So I wanna, I wanna thinking about kind of executive function as the command center, you know, for us, for making our decisions and moving through our thoughts. I want to look at it in two different ways if we could today. I want to think about the role executive function has in learning, in generally speaking, but I also want to think about the role executive function has for our students who struggle in our math classroom. So can we kind of talk about those two pieces, the role executive function has for learning in general, and then if we can kind of segue into what does the role look like for our students who struggle in math. Can you help us out there? Sure, I'll take the um, general uh, executive functioning play in learning. And, you know, as a uh, mostly a behaviorist, I'm going to sort of operationally define executive functioning as observable, measurable terms. Okay. Or you might actually see. So these are things like is a student paying attention? Hmm. Is this engaged in the task at hand? Are they able to organize their work? Can they plan ahead? Can they start a task and stay on a task or persist? Are they able to keep track of what they are doing? And there's also this emotional control part too. Is a student um, is the student able to sustain attention on that task without getting disrupted or distracted? I think it's important to think about how are these executive functions played out in observable, measurable ways because that allows us to address the learning component. So when we think about that, it's that, that attention, the engagement, the organization, the planning, the task initiation, and then task persistence all kind of plays into what could happen in a learning environment for our students. Um, and as you had said, Dr. Cotting was to really make it kind of observable. What can I observe? What can I measure to really be able to speak to the executive functioning of a student in a learning environment? So, and I would just add, I think that was well done, Robin, but I, I mean, what I would add is, you know, there's obviously a correlation between mm -hmm. measured executive function skills and academic proficiencies. That, that has been documented. However, it's been, it's much less promising, however, in the data are much less promising around intervening for mm -hmm. improving these observable executive function skills as a mechanism to improve academic achievement. And what I worry about is, you know, if you think about schools are really sort of economies and the, the, econ the, the resource that is limited is time. And teachers have to make decisions every day about where am I going to allocate my time resource for 
the most amount of learning. And what the evidence right now is pretty clear about is that if you really want to improve math outcomes, then you really need to work on math skill proficiencies rather than working on these um, op operationalized executive function skills as a mechanism to improve math understanding and math learning. So when we think about that kind of that, that two-pronged question I had, how does the, what's the role of executive function in, in learning in general? But then what, you know, what's the role when we think about students who struggle in math? Does it really come down to building up math proficiency? Is that what it comes down to or is there something more? Is there, do those skills play a larger role? Well, it's, a, it's what's clear to me is that you cannot intervene for those skills and then magically receive the benefit in terms mm. of improved academic achievement. Okay. That's what the data tell us. You have to directly intervene for mm. the academic skill um, gaps that you observe, and that comes through direct interventions for the um, skills and the understandings that you're trying to establish. Now, I mean, good academic interventions ought, need to include behavioral components. So, we, what we very commonly see is, um, for just as an example, we always include a motivation component in our in our academic interventions and one might argue that that actually benefits executive function in some way that's not the way we think about it we just think about it as as a practical way to um, help ch children attain deeper proficiency and understanding because they can receive some type of small privilege or reward for um, demonstrating growth in their performance over time well, I think those are two key pieces, and it kind of leads me to this question of, well, then, you know, what does this mean for me in my classroom, in a, in a general education classroom, but also for intervention? When I think about the executive function pieces in learning and how it, it may impact um, our, our process for learning and how we can build up our skills to potentially improve our executive functioning skills, what does this mean for me in the classroom? What do I take away from this as the educator? And how do I change my practice based on what you're sharing today? Uh, well, I think I want to reiterate again uh, what Amanda said. There's this there, because this is a really common misperception in education in general that if we address aptitudes, which executive functioning would essentially be aptitude, how what's our working memory aptitude that we're actually going to be um, impacting skills, and that is absolutely not the truth. That's not the evidence. The evidence suggests that if you want to address skills, you need to tackle skills. You have to teach skills. So I think that's a really important component. I think what's been really interesting to think about um, as we were writing this, trying to talk uh, and think through um, this misperception is exactly what Amanda was just talking about, which is, for example, we add a reward component. I always have a reward component too. Students, of course, need to stay engaged. But there was this, also this fascinating piece that I just read on explicit instruction. And the idea was, well, how do we intensify intervention for students that are most at risk or have the most difficulties um, with learning math. And the idea is, well, we put them with explicit instruction. Well, why? Well, why? Because explicit instruction is a way to model, guide, break down problems into smaller parts. So if there is, if there happens to be a challenges with working memory, if there happens to be challenges with reasoning, explicit instruction will address both of those. We provide checklists and heuristics to cue problem solving steps. Well, if there happens to be difficulties with organization and planning, providing mm -hmm. check and heuristics is going to be a useful approach. Um, provided reinforcement, as we already talked about, for staying on task. We're going to break problems down into smaller components. That's going to address working memory load. Um, we're going to use visual representations. We're going to minimize the language load. So all of these things are actually best evidence-based practices for teaching math. Right. But yeah. they will also address these other things if they are, are happening to exist. Right, so it's really about instructional design. Mm -hmm. If you want to improve learning, you have to deliver more, better and, and um, more intensive instruction, right? More precise instruction. And, and we know how to do that. That's not mysterious, right? Um, the, the one thing I wanted to mention was uh, Matt Burns had a student, I think her name was uh, Helen Young, I hope I'm right about that. And uh, she did a dissertation and she found that um, given a uh, simple flashcard intervention that was not beautifully controlled in terms of what children encountered in terms of task difficulty, working memory did account for some of the results, some of the outcome and learning that they got with that intervention. But given a, a better controlled flashcard strategy called incremental rehearsal, 
the power, the association between working memory and the outcome went totally away. I don't think she's published that work yet, but it was really just beautiful work. And it speaks to this idea that I think you're saying so, so well, which is if you just deliver really effective evidence-based intervention, explicit instruction is, a, is mm -hmm. that is a great model for people to follow, then you are controlling for some of these um, things that might serve as barriers to learning. And you know, and I would argue that we're, that could be applied in any classroom, right? Yeah. No matter what the content area is, that explicit instruction and thinking through the design and the delivery, particularly those two, the design and the de delivery and where they come together, kind of where they intersect, that's when we may be making an impact on these executive function skills, um, but ultimately it's, it's good practice. It's what should be happening in every classroom. We should be setting goals. We should be establishing a purpose. We should be um, reinforcing with motivators. We should be breaking down larger concept into smaller pieces and modeling and guiding and offering feedback. Those are all things that we should be doing. And in turn, they may certainly have an impact on those executive function pieces which may you know, certainly play into some of that. And I think that's, that's something that was interesting in the article was to really think about that tension and put it into perspective you know, and, and really think through um, you know, how much attention and energy am I going to give to this piece when I could be offering a good delivery and a strong design um, and good practice that would kind of close that question for me of whether or not, oh, it's, a, it's an executive function issue. Well, maybe I need to do something with my design and delivery. So I think that's something that's a, that was a powerful piece, I think, through reading the article. So I'm thank you both for kind of clarifying that piece for us. One of the things that um, I'd want to ask, and, um, and Dr. Cotting, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. When we think about what people, what classroom teachers, what administrators, what parents should be taking away when we're think, thinking about how to um, step away from this tension of executive, you know, the child has executive function issues, so therefore can't. Um, you know, what advice might we offer to them or how can we explain to them there, you know, we need to look at the skill-based practice. We need to look at the instruction that they're receiving to be able to kind of mitigate that concern. What, what could we say to them? What could we share with them? Well, I mean, I think I would start with, you know, all children can learn no matter what these difficulties are coming from we need to be thinking about what are the students strengths but I mean I, this really goes back to figuring out where the student is on that skill development hierarchy what are the skills they know what are the skills they don't know and what are the what is an evaluation of the instructional environment and the instructional principles that they're receiving what is the classroom environment look at we often talk to our students about first we have to evaluate the instruction the curriculum and the environment and make sure that is sufficient before we ever learn characteristics. Um, and often what we see in schools is that, is that there are not effective instruction uh, curriculum or environmental um, background in order to sufficiently look at what the learner characteristics are. So we really need to move in, moving schools to evaluating their systems along those three areas before we talk about learner presentations. Once we talk about learner presentations, we of course want to be able to think about what well, what if a student isn't responding to the thing that we've delivered? And then you're really needing to look at, we have to have data mm -hmm. to illustrate what is the responding looking like and then figure out what does a student know and not know what have they been exposed to and not exposed to and how has it been taught to them in order to really identify what each individual student might need. So it's really looking at that, you know, at a systems level before we look at the learner level is really what are we doing as a system before we start saying what's what's going on with the learner and I think that's a key piece to make um, and again in, in all contexts but I think um, when we think about that executive function piece I think that's something to keep in mind so I appreciate that. Dr. Vander Hayden do you have anything to add in that regard of what we may offer to those in the field? No I think Robin said it well and I mean it just comes back to that sort of return on investment your mm -hmm. biggest your biggest return is going to come from highly effective instruction not focusing on measuring these learner characteristics and then trying to adjust your instruction to support that. No, I think that's a, big, a, a good piece to kind of end with. So I thank you both so that, you know, it's been such a joy. I know we, um, we have some more to, to converse about regarding the article that you had um, published in the communique, but I'm, I've been so enjoying our conversations. Um, and I want to thank you both for dedicating so much time to sitting with Pat and Pod and going through the article and the, the tensions and the underpinnings behind it. So thank you so much for that. I want to thank all of you in the field. You truly inspire educational growth in your students every day. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Patent Pod.